I'm, I'll be curious. Oh, yeah, I'll be curious to um, to hear from you all uh, once we get talking about what what line of work you're in, what your background is, um, because I'll I'll be talking um, about I think the value of ethical dilemmas, um, and it's a sort of general purpose value. I, I want to focus on the way that we can use dilemmas uh, as a as a way of thinking about. Um, the ethical tensions that arise in education in particular. And, and quite a bit of my work recently has been working with K-12 teachers on that very thing, um, sitting down with concrete case studies and uh, presenting them with accounts often based in sort of anecdotal and interview evidence from, from real educators um, of dilemmas that they face in, the, in, the, in their teaching in the classroom. And then there's a version of that you can do for educational leadership, for example, principal, superintendents, uh, you name it. Um, but I, I have focused, you know, often on education, and, and some of the examples I have for us today are education. But you know, if we're not all educators, I, I'm I'm certainly um, willing to have a, a more general conversation and to humor that um, and see where it takes us. Um, but what I'd like to do. Uh, first and foremost, is just set the stage with a couple preliminary remarks. I'd like to keep it, you know, sort of informal and discussion oriented, but um, just to sort of get our thoughts flowing um, and to, you know, sort of provide some conceptual resources. I'll be sharing my screen, talking pretty briefly. I just put a link in the chat. There's a folder there. I'll refer to some of the stuff in the folder. Um, you should be able to open it and access it straight away. Um, but with that, I will get started here. Okay. So I do interject if you don't see that image. Do you see my, my screen? Can I get a nod if you see it? I can see yeah. thumbnails, perfect. Okay, so I just wanna start, the way I would, I, I'd like to set the stage for thinking about ethical dilemmas in education or ethical dilemmas generally is a, a, an image I quite like that applies to philosophy, uh, but also uh, I think in particular to ethics. And it's um, it centers on a contrast. So on the left, you'll see uh, suburbs, well-regimented, planned, uh, methodically outlined suburbs with very planned and sort of homogenous homes and streets. And on the right, you'll see an ancient city center uh, in all its messiness. Um, and, you know, it's a sort of rich image for a couple of reasons. Uh, the comparison I'd like to make here is, is one that um, others have made, which is you can think of the sciences, for example, like physics, biology, um, as well-regimented, organized, methodical uh, sorts of inquiry, um, much like the suburbs, where you know not everybody's going to go there. Not of not all of us live in the suburbs. Not all of us will learn the physics that you need to learn to figure out how to get a rocket to the moon. Um, but all of us, in virtue of being human beings who are socialized and who interact with one another uh, and who have views about beauty, justice, fairness, and so on, we do uh, sort of traverse the city center and we do interact and we do exchange. And it's a nice image for um, this idea that just in virtue of being a human being, we already have implicit commitments, philosophical, ethical, uh, and so on. Um, and I think it's really important to start that way. When we're thinking about ethical dilemmas, we're thinking about um, refining a skill that we already have. We're not starting from scratch. We're we, I do think that one of the promises of philosophy and of ethics is to get better perhaps and to get wiser and to get more discerning, um, but we're not starting from, from the bottom. Um, we're, we're starting sort of in the middle of things already with sort of views about what's valuable, what's good, what's right, and so on. So there's more to say about this comparison, but I'd like to start with that image that our space today is going to be uh, on the right side of this image. We're gonna be dwelling in the messy city center where the answers are sometimes hard to come by. Their sort of disagreement persists despite well-intentioned efforts to think really hard about ethical dilemmas and ethical cases. Um, and we all pass through the city center unlike those regimented suburbs. So it's just a nice little image um, I like to start with. Um, and when it comes to you know, thinking about dilemmas through case studies, 
Uh, the way I like to think of it is this is about getting better in the way that I just described. It's about honing this sort of fundamental human skill and impulse that we have. Um, and it's about practicing. It's a, it's a sort of artificial tool for uh, practicing other than just making decisions in life and uh, learning to sort of weigh trade-offs and so on and, and deliberate. Um, we can actually practice this in community and together. And what I think is really powerful about using cases, case studies, or as we'll do in a, uh, in a bit as well, little vignettes. I mean, I'm talking a few lines that just tell you a story about an, you have someone in a situation who needs to make a decision, in this case, a teacher uh, teaching in their classroom. Um, it presents you uh, with an opportunity to make those decisions uh, sort of in an artificial way. And the process that I think it's initiating, uh, and the way I like to think about it and frame it, uh, is reflective equilibrium. Now, that's a sort of mouthful in a way, and it sounds jargony, but it's a really simple idea. It's a really powerful idea, in my opinion. It's a reason that we should return again and again to case studies as a tool for ethical reflection across the lifespan, whether professional context or whatever it may be. Um, and in this case, I put it in the language of an educator, but you, it's an opportunity to set your value judgments against each other, to see whether there's inconsistencies, and ultimately by sort of reflecting on concrete cases in light of your more general commitments and vice versa, you know, getting closer to the truth, revising what you previously held, um, especially uh, your normative or value-based commitments, um, and ultimately by sort of finding a kind of coherence and consistency and doing this in community with other people because we're fallible uh, and we only ever have partial knowledge, especially about moral and ethical matters, um, we can hope that we get closer to the truth. But this is yet another image I think that's really powerful. Why use these cases? Because they're concrete cases uh, in which you're invited to say, this is the right thing to do. And by doing that, you need to square that determination that you come to with your more general commitments. We all have general commitments about what's right and what's fair and what's just and so on. What educators owe their students, what educators owe parents, you name it. Um, and it, but the cases sort of prompt you to put that together with very concrete particular decisions. And that sets you off and I think a lifelong process of reflective equilibrium. Um, there's an image, if you Google it, uh, it's not perfect, but I like it because it captures that feedback loop that sort of that you should be thinking of when you think of reflective equilibrium is you should, you know, let's start at the top. You're presented with a case and we're going to we're about to read some when when uh, when we transition here and, and you have some intuition, you have some judgment. You know, maybe it's not just uh, an answer you give willy nilly, but it's a well considered intuition or judgment about a case. You know, this person uh, should say this to the student. Well, okay, then, then you get to generalize and reflect, well, what does that mean about what I think teachers ought to do for or say to students? And maybe you sort of come up with some principle or some general rule. And then that rule can help you think about future cases. It can help you think about future scenarios that you're put in. Uh, but it may very well be, and it often is the case, that your intuitions clash with your principles or your principles clash with your intuitions. And there, that's not a bad thing. That's not a problem. That's the sign of being a reflective human being and of encountering new situations. But what you get to do is then sort of make them work. So I like this image of a little feedback loop. And this is, as I say, a lifelong process. And what is, I hope, the result? Um, well, I think it would be too much to say that ethics and philosophy and, and some of these tools will deliver the right answers that will provide a silver bullet. There is no algorithm for uh, decision making in ethically fraught situations or for weighing the trade offs of values and so on. Um, it doesn't even, it's not even sufficient. If you studied really, really hard and thought really hard about what's valuable and what's good and you knew how weighty different considerations were, that still wouldn't get you the right answer because of the fact of the matter is every time you're making a decision, you're in a context that's sort of unique, that's infinitely nuanced and rich in information. And as a decision maker, certainly as an educator, and this goes for any human being, um, you need to, in the moment, sort of organize and give shape to all the considerations and values at play. Um, so it'll never be the case 
that you've got a silver bullet, that you've got an algorithm that says, okay, I, I've got a, a way that if I ever encounter an ethical dilemma, we just plug it in, boop, answer, you know, just as if I'm Googling it or something. Um, we'll never get there, but we can cultivate something like practical wisdom. And all practical wisdom really is, is this ability to see or discern in new situations what is consistent with your moral values and your moral principles. Um, so it's a kind of perception, which is a really, I like the image of a quarterback and I don't watch very much football, but I at least know what a quarterback does um, and the sort of important role they play um, on the football team. But what's important about a, what, what the quarterback does is despite all their planning and their sort of memorization of the moves and, the, and their expectation about what their wide receiver is going to do is nothing can replace the fact that when they hike the ball, they need to make a concrete judgment in that sort of unique situation about what the situation allows, what is the best place, you know, what is the best move to make the best throw person to throw to and so on. There is no algorithm for that. That's practical wisdom. That's judgment. We can hone it. We can practice it. We have the ability to do this um, in virtue of being human beings, um, just as I sort of suggested with the city center image, but it does take practice. So the ethical case studies are a tool for this. Um, I just want to point to two. There, there are a number of resources out there. Um, if you're interested in K-12 educational ethics in particular, on the left, you'll see Justice in Schools, which is a project at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. They make tons of case studies fully free online, including additional resources. Sometimes they do dramatic readings and reenactments of the cases, which is a nice way to watch them. They also publish books, so you can buy the books that have wonderful cases with commentaries from educators, philosophers, superintendents, you name it, commenting on the case, saying something about what they see as at stake, what's valuable, what the trade-off is, what the dilemma is, or what the right thing to do is. That's one big resource on the education side. If you're looking for more general purpose case studies that get at any sort of moral or political issue, that you could introduce really across the lifespan. Um, I do recommend the resources that we produce at the PAR Center for Ethics through the National High School Ethics Bowl website. There's a case archive going back at least 10 years with free downloadable cases um, that we use with high school students, of course, in the competition, uh, but also with older adults and with professionals. Um, so again, those are just some resources. I'd be happy to say more. Um, that's just an image here. We're not going to actually read through this, but um, if you go to the Justice in Schools website, they even provide guidance on how you might facilitate conversations about these dilemmas. So you might go to your school or to your workplace and sort of present folks with the case. Well, here's a way of setting that conversation up for success. Some of the questions you might look at when you're reading a case um, are helpfully outlined there. Again, I'd be happy to say much more about this and how I've used it in various applications across the lifespan or in sort of teacher-facing opportunities. Um, what I'd like to do, though, is transition to talking about some concrete cases and just show you uh, what I think is the power of this. So what we're going to start with is if you open this QR code, if your preference is to scan it, this is just the same link I shared with you at the beginning. Um, open that folder. And let's start with the file that's got vignettes in the title. It should be educator vignettes. So I wanted to show you kind of two styles of cases, and maybe we only spend the rest of the time on this. Just depends on how much uh, conversation we, we have uh, on the vignettes. Um, these are really short form writing. You can sight read these in 30 seconds. You can write your own versions and variations on them, which I think is a very fruitful exercise. Um, and we'll, we'll begin there. So what I'm going to do is stop sharing. Um, I'm going to invite you to I'll give you a moment to actually read it so that you, you, you have a second. Um, but first, I will take any sort of questions, clarificatory, or if, if there's something I went through hastily, I'm happy to say more. Otherwise, we're going to transition to looking at the vignette. So just, I'll give it a moment. Who, anybody have questions about anything I said? Um, or is there something I can be a bit clearer about? Okay, so, oh, is that a hand? No, that's a thumb, okay. <laughs> okay, so open, everybody, you can see the folder, right? That's not a mystery, okay. So you see the educator vignettes. 